There you go. All right. So welcome to finishing up the plagues here in the book of Exodus. Uh, so we're going to pick up um, Exodus chapter 10 uh, with the plague of darkness. So chapter 10, verse 21. Um, that is uh, page 22. Um, and we're going to spend just a little bit of time wrapping up. So this is going to be the just a little, I'm going to show you a little video about locusts um, because they're still a thing. Um, and I guess that's a thing. Like I've, I've noticed a couple of grasshoppers in my yard over the last two weeks, but one to two is a whole lot different than what they experienced there um, in Egypt. So I'm going to show you a video on that to start. Then we'll do plague of darkness and then we'll get into the 10th plague, which leads into the Passover. And I'm pretty sure that'll take up our whole, our whole time here today. Uh, so it's a really significant event uh, we have. So let's uh, begin with prayer, and then um, we'll go see a video about locusts. So let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to come and worship you. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we would grow in our faith and our understanding, our wisdom in you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So I'm going to just show. So swarms of locusts. That's still a real thing. Um, and I learned my lesson last time for people on Google Meet. I am going to mute the mic because it should come through. Um, the audio should come through the meeting when I hit present. Um, if not, just shoot messages because I'll hear the notification, OK?
All right, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the plague of locusts would have been like. Um, They're bigger than grasshoppers. They are bigger than grasshoppers. Edible too, so. Well, not in my diet. <laughs> <laughs> but you can get them. You can. You can add it to your diet, Eric. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they come in like like sriracha flavored and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is. Uh, that's locusts, um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea. So it, it's even worse than that. Uh, so we saw what that was. That looks pretty bad. So. That's them hitting the crops. Yeah, so that's just. how they devastated Egypt was hitting their crops, and their shade trees and everything else. Yeah, and this is after the hail has already came through and destroyed a lot of it. Um, so, okay, so that uh, ends up plague of locusts. Uh, so let's go plague of darkness. Uh, so cha Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. So Julia, did that did that audio not come over? I just saw that now. Right. She responds. There. Okay. There we go. No sound. Okay. Well, so I still can't figure out Google Meet. Before it caused, caused reverbs, this time there's just no sound. Not helpful. Okay. Eh, technology. Um, anyway, BBC Earth, if you want to look up uh, Plague of Locusts and see what it looks like. But Plague of Darkness, uh, Exodus 10, 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky so that the darkness will spread over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the place where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. and He was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. So remember that. So just know that what comes next is you're going to hear Moses talking to Pharaoh. So the assumption is that this next part comes still in this meeting that Moses didn't actually leave his presence until he tells him about the 10th plague, uh, just so you feel like, wait a minute, he said he left. Well, he gives him the, the instructions on the 10th plague, and then he leaves and never sees Pharaoh again. All right, but plague of darkness. So uh, what is it, obviously? What was the plague? Well, it was more than just not, not having light because they said you could feel it. Yeah, yeah. It was probably more like a So I Dark fog or whatever. You can feel fog, that's why I'm thinking so much. It's true. That's true. Um, so my thought was anybody ever uh, gone into a cave, been inside a cave? Mm -hmm. Is that darkness you can kind of feel when they do that thing to you where they're like, okay, we're gonna turn off the lights and it's like don't move. <laughs> that's kind of the the darkness. I, I so it's not going outside in dark, especially not for us. I mean, we have, you know, so many lights still just with street lights, uh, car lights, all of that. But then you still always have, you know, the, the moon and the stars giving off some light. This is no light. Um, it is a thick darkness where you, when you can't see your hand in front of your face kind of darkness. It lasted for three days, uh, three days. So I think movies, and they, that's a lighting issue, you know, they always have to present it like, oh, it's like dark storm clouds coming over, because you have to actually still see the movie. 
Um, but I think to get the true feel of this darkness, like, yeah, like just, it's encompassing. You cannot see people around you to the point where they did not leave their homes for three days. Um, you can understand that a little bit, right? <laughs> Under COVID quarantine, not leaving your house. Um, yeah, so this is really a darkness you can feel. And then uh, who was affected? Egyptians. Yeah, just the Egyptians. So that, how crazy is that, that the Egyptians have the darkness and the Israelites have light? They can actually see and go about their normal day. Uh, so if we go back to that idea of like, is each one of these plagues a judgment on Egyptian gods? This is where you'd say it's against the sun god, Ra, uh, of Egypt. Um, and then what was the Egyptian response, mainly pharaohs? But he told them they could leave, but had to leave their cattle. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could go, but you can take your women and children, but don't, you can't take your cattle. You got to come back for your cattle. Again, you can see Pharaoh's trying to like, I don't want you to actually leave. Um, and then Moses is like, well, but we have to, we have to use it for sacrifice and we don't know what we're going to need until we're there. And then Pharaoh's follow-up response. What'd you say, Gary? Hardening the heart. Yeah, who hardened his heart? Yeah, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So to fill out um, that, uh, that little diagram, page... I'm going to go find it now. Okay, so page 15 in the study guide. So this one is um, 1027. So it's the Lord hardened in the present um, Pharaoh's heart. And so Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so Pharaoh says, get out. Get out. I don't want to ever see you again. The day you see me, the day you will die. Um, so this is this is it. This is like, okay, we're not dealing with this um, anymore ever again. All right. Um, so that's Plague of Darkness. So you guys ready for the tenth and final plague now? All right. Yeah, it is. This is grand finale. So Exodus uh, chapter 11. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. So remember, uh, the whole you will plunder them. Here it is. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people. And Moses' self was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. Which that's just a nice insight of, you know, Pharaoh keeps hardening his heart, but he's actually, Moses is respected by the, the Egyptian officials. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. So this is still in the presence of Pharaoh before leaving that last time. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, go, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in, in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Uh, so again, that's another reference. Who hardens whose heart? At the very end. The Lord, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So you see, it was... The Lord said he would the first two times, and then it's like seven, nine times of the Pharaoh doing it. And now it's the Lord hardening his heart. Uh, we see kind of on the tail end of it. All right, so we, we have the basic 
of what the plague will be. There's more detail that's going to be given and the actual event is still to occur. Um, so, but what is the going to be the plague, uh, the 10th plague? The firstborn. Yeah, it's so the firstborn son specifically. Um, of who? Of Egypt. Of, of Egypt, noting from Pharaoh to the slave girl, doesn't matter. Um, and then even firstborn of the cattle as well. Uh, so again, the animals are very much associated with the people. Uh, so that's why the animals are not exempt from this. Um, so you've got that and um, we'll, uh, we'll come back to who was affected when it actually uh, shows and then the, then the response. All right, here. Oh, giver of life. Uh, that's what faith says about the, yeah, the God. Um, also, I had noted um, Pharaoh is often thought of as Ra in person. So this one is actually specifically against Pharaoh because it's going to be one of Pharaoh's sons that dies in this plague. All right. Um, so before we move on more into the Passover, which comes in connection with the 10th plague, um, kind of just a reflection on the 10 plagues in general. Uh, which plague do you think, totally opinion question, which plague do you think would have been the scariest, grossest, or most upsetting to you? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, oh yeah, to have your, your firstborn son uh, die. Yeah. And to know it's, it's not just an isolated incident but the whole nation. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the harder things to mourn is, is when your son, your child dies before you. Uh, any other just thoughts? Because this is totally an opinion question. Uh, and Julia also said, yeah. <laughs> Julie also said the tenth, even though I don't have kids. Um, yeah, just all that, all that death, in one night. Anybody else want to chime in, or is that we kind of, <laughs> kind of the tenth? Yeah, is you figure how many people would that actually have been? A lot. After all that already happened, I'm sure the. There's a lot of people in Egypt at that time that, that that were trying to get the point across <laughs> somehow. You know that they saw already that everything that Moses had done through God had worked. So yeah, and here there there actually is going to be a way to be protected from this plague. Um, yeah. The flies? Yeah. Not the most upsetting, but the <laughs> Yeah. And that's what I say. had an infestation of flies. I went to my apartment. The most disgusting thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. Closest I came, it was Minnesota. Yes. Yeah. Rome. But it was um, those Japanese beetles that look like ladybugs. Oh, yeah. So. No, no. These were like big, huge horse flies. Oh. They were nasty. Yeah, that is really and nasty. And then my brother come in and kill them for me. Well, good. I'm glad to get them out of there. Was, yeah. yeah awesome. Those those Japanese beetles, though, like they were like just. I remember that in the dorm, they were just like, like a clump. Uh -huh. Like they would just all clump up and like, you smash them and they stink, <laughs> and then they just kind of keep coming back. Um, Is that the ones that we always call stink bugs? But I think I don't know. So other people think stink bugs are a different kind of bug. These are yeah, these ones look like ladybugs, but they're not as bright. Um, yeah, you know, you kind of wish they were ladybugs, but they would bite you too. They were mean. That's the way with those big flies. They're the only ones that could bite me, and they're really hurt. Yeah, the horse. That's when you said like horse flies. Like those are nasty. Yeah, they're been bitten by those. You seen the love bugs in the south? They come out in June, 
they're bad. I mean, they're, they don't bite, but they're tiny. Okay. They get all over your, okay. you can't keep your mouth shut. <laughs> well, that was, um, so yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I talked about that too, about flies, um, about wearing your, your gator so that you don't have flies come in your <laughs> mouth while you're riding your bike uh, down a trail, right? Um, but yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think we, we kind of trumped it with the 10th, but uh, what was the economic impact of the plagues? We kind of talked touched on this a little bit, but just, just to realize. I think it ruined them because their yeah. crops are gone. They're not going to be able to feed their people. Yeah. You wonder how they recovered. I mean, some of them, um, there were some crops that were still coming up, but then the locusts came. It's just like, do they even have food the next year? Yeah. Um, just how devastating. If they, they did, it was very, very little. I mean, they would have definitely been uh, cut back to areas, and then they probably would have to buy some from neighboring and it's so that would have ruined them, you know, as far as money wise. And I thought about that too. What you just said, Eric, of, of like, isn't it kind of funny how it's almost a little bit reversed from Joseph? Yeah. Joseph had people coming to them to buy food, and now it's going to be the Egyptians have to go to other people to get through this year. Um, yeah. Uh, the day to day impact. I mean, some of these these plagues, like, just think about think about the aftermath of some of these plagues. Like, uh, just going to go through it, like, darkness, you can't go out of your house for three days. Um, you know, I, I, I was uh, self-quarantined for two weeks. I only went out to go get COVID test, but, and I did go out running, but, uh, yeah, to actually think, like, you just can't leave your house. You're just there. Nothing. Like, you can't walk outside at all. Um, yeah, the, the impact of that. And then think about some of the other ones. Um, blood, the plague of blood. Um, you have to completely find new water sources. You just can't go get the normal water that you have. Um, then uh, you go through, what have we got? The, the frogs, which they stank. It specifically says they just yeah. stunk the place up. And you got piles of these frog corpses everywhere that are rotting and decaying. Um, the, the lice or the gnats, uh, again, just more of the irritation of the bug bites and stuff like that. Um, then uh, the livestock, uh, yeah, plague of flies, that one I'm not so sure about, much more than just the annoyance of it. Um, but then livestock, I mean, your livestock actually died. So again, the economic impact. Um, and then the boils, how long did it take for those to heal? Did they still uh, have to deal with them? Um, and then the hail, um, what kind of damage? Like we just had, you know, our windstorm here a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I don't know. Most people, I think, dealt with it the day of. And then you had lines and lines out of the... Um, the dump where you, where you get rid of all the yard waste, um, all that cleanup effort that had to be done. I still have one little pile in my yard that I have to ch chuck of stuff from that storm. Um, so it creates all that extra work. Then you got the, the locusts, which at least it seems like the locusts were just pushed away. So, I mean, each one had like these immediate, you had to deal with the effects of these plagues. And then the psychological impact. What do you guys think about a psychological impact? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What's next? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you kind of got to hear it from the officials who um, you were telling Pharaoh, like, the land is ruined. Let him go. Like, we're done with this. Like, do something to make this better. Uh, but yeah, you just, you get this impression that they're, they're very afraid and uh, maybe even... Uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The plundering part comes back into play. The just, we'll pay you to leave now. 
So the ones that we were forcing into our slaves, we're actually going to pay them to leave us so that we can stop being affected by them. See, that had hurt too, economically. Yeah, well, like, yes, stuff. yes. Huge. Now they don't have money to buy food from other areas. Yeah, you don't have the money, and then you don't have the slave labor. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. If someone pointed to the plagues and said, God is a cosmic monster, a sadist, how would you respond? God is a monster for inflicting this. Sarah. Does everything have a reason? What kind of good reason can he have to kill all the firstborn children, firstborn sons? You tell me how that's a loving God. Say say a little louder. Say I couldn't quite hear you. It I did this be blood of Egypt. It did, yeah. It served that purpose, and at the same time, what does it show the Egyptians? This God has way more power than any of theirs they have. This is the one and only true God. Shows he's a just. Because Pharaoh would not let him go, would he? I mean, all the way up. It's going to take this 10th plague, even though he's kind of like conceited for a little bit, but then he quickly hardens his heart. Um, Pharaoh would not let these people go. And what kind of person just enforces slavery upon people um, to their detriment, the detriment of their own nation? Um, and, you know, this is like God's a sadist. I'm like, well, why doesn't Pharaoh have more common sense <laughs> and just let him go? Or at least, you know, we talked about that when we first kind of began this section of, you know, uh, an employer knows that if his employees are happy, he'll get better results in general. So why not grant them the three day, you know, holiday? But no, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do that right from the beginning. Um, so in this one, um, maybe a good way to respond is simply, uh, oh, here we got a, I don't know, I'll just bump back in. But maybe a, a good way to respond is simply, well, why do you think he's a he's a monster? And it probably is going to be, and that's so cheap. Sierra, you totally got the adult course of, of Pastor Klein challenges, answers. So I know you can take it. So thank you. Um, but yeah, they, they just, you want to start out with the why do you think that? And Because we can assume why they think that. Um, but why do you think that? Um, you know, that serves no good purpose. Well, well, it did serve a good purpose, though. Um, you know, that whole Columbo we talked about years ago with leading with questions, um, where it is, um, why do you think that? Well, it couldn't have served anyone any good. Well, did it serve anyone something good? Yeah, the Israelites, I and mean, they were protected from it, and then they would be rescued from slavery. Did you want people to be in slavery? Now, that's a hot button issue right now. <laughs> You wanted people to remain slaves. Um, don't be, don't be so um, and snide. That's me. We have no idea what, how many Egyptians turned to him, to the real God because they realized their God was was crap. Their gods were crap. And yeah, how many converted? Yeah, and on top is, of that, his ultimate goal is to bring people to him. Right. Right. So. Yeah, very we good. Not, we might not see it, but and it might not be told in the Bible, but there's people we can speculate on some of the things that could have happened. That's very good. We do know some. Um, and actually, when you started talking, I actually thought you were going to go to a different place that I didn't quite remember, and then I just did when you started talking about it. Do you remember what happened to get Moses, you know, Why Moses was even a big deal, I guess. Like, they were killing off Egyptian boys, little babies. I mean, that's what Pharaoh was doing. I mean, this is almost just eye for an eye at this point. Um, you know, we'll just slaughter all your, your babies when they're born, your, your baby boys. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's got to remember. Um, it's not like Pharaoh's this nice, fluffy guy who loves the Israelites. 
Uh, he's he's trying to genocide uh, their race, more or less. Um, yeah, why should God, and I think that brings it back to our God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And so wrongs must be accounted for. Um, do we really want a God who would just let the slaughter of innocent babies just go unpunished? Um, now, granted, how does that work with us? We know Jesus ultimately takes the punishment we deserve. Uh, that's the, the hope any of us have. Um, so this is this is a point to, to remember God is a God of justice, not just a God of mercy. Uh, we need his justice, too. All right. Um, why didn't Pharaoh just kill Moses and be done with him? He feared. I think something had happened. <laughs> yeah, there's there's enough of a healthy fear there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially because you hear the officials respect Moses. Um, why else? Why else had Pharaoh not just killed Moses and been done with him earlier? I think any, any God that the Egyptians had, you could see the change coming when their thoughts or their wishes were denied. Coming down there and then explaining which God was insulted and I'm sure right after that, they came out with something, well, he's not really a God. You know, to me, that be known. So it's just the way God set it up. Yeah, that's kind of one of our maybe uh, more straightforward answers. It's like, well, God protected him. That's why Pharaoh didn't do it. Um, another reason for you, I mean, you kill a leader of a disgruntled people, you're probably just going to make them into a martyr, right? Uh, probably rallying more people into this cause if you see this is how Pharaoh uh, behaves. Um, all right. Um, then how did you see Moses' confidence grow over the period of the 10 plagues? How did you see his confidence grow over the period of the 10 plagues? Well, I know he went from him being very, very respectful to here at the end, he's very angry at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he is okay challenging and even to a degree, uh, I guess we could say at least um, chastising, uh, verbally rebuking, rebuke's a good word here, uh, verbally rebuking Pharaoh. Um, you kind of see him go from, oh, you, you just tell me when, Pharaoh. You tell me what day you want me to pray for you, and I'll do it. Um, and then goes into, well, you better not go back on your word, Pharaoh, to just here, just with anger, like, hey, pff, you're going to get judged. Um, you have it coming. So you really do see, um, yeah, that, that change in Moses' interactions with Pharaoh. You see his confidence growing that the Lord is going to come through with this. Uh, then I put a couple of personal reflection questions in there. I don't actually want answers in class, but things to think about. Have you ever received a warning from God and continued in sin? Uh, what was the outcome? How might the outcome have been different if you had heeded earlier correction? Is there a warning you are currently choosing to ignore? So that's just a reflection, kind of putting yourself in the place of Pharaoh. Um, am I not listening to God's word? And does that ever go well? Uh, when might we employ bargaining tactics with God like Pharaoh did? Uh, what faulty thinking about ourselves and our God does bargaining reveal? Uh, so again, just kind of going against the whole bargaining thing. All right, we're going to attempt... This is going to be more than we can chew, I think. Oh, we'll attempt uh, to finish up the Passover here. So picking up Exodus 12, verse 1. 
Um, so note in this first question, uh, what the qualities of the Passover lamb? And then also the second question, what do the bitter herbs represent and the bread without yeast? Um, and we'll look at uh, a few other places uh, for that. Okay, so Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they, should, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they, ate, where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for gen the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or native born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night. There was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my, leave my people, you and your Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go and also bless me. 
the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. There's the fulfillment. The Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. There was about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people went up with them as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough that they had brought from Egypt, they baked cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt. They did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now the length of the time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it. Any slave you have bought may eat of it after you have circumcised him, but a temporary resident and a hired worker may not eat of it. It must be eaten inside one house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like the one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat of it. The same law applies to the native born and to the alien living among you. All the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. All right, we'll leave uh, chapter 13 for right now. Okay, um, so before the 10th plague comes, the Lord institutes a very special celebration and meal for his people called the Passover. The focal point was the lamb that was sacrificed and eaten. What were the qualities of the Passover lamb? So what were the qualities that you noted? Tell you, without any defect, perfect. Yeah. What other qualities? One-year-old male. So young, one-year-old, male, perfect. Uh, these are the qualities uh, that go into the Passover lamb. Um, what else about, and in, in especially the, the preparing of the, the Passover lamb? Here's things maybe you can, you guys have the, the luxury of hindsight bias, so you can see some of the things that foreshadow Jesus. What else about how they prepared the Passover lamb? Was something worth noting. No broken bones. So yeah, so you're going to roast it and not break any of the bones. No bones will be broken. And that ends up being direct prophecy of Jesus. Um, the roasting, as opposed to like boiling, um, is actually, this is how shepherds would do it. I found out in reading this. This is how shepherds would prepare um, food. They wouldn't have the time to boil. I just thought that was interesting. Um, so that could have significance as Jesus is the great shepherd. That's also what you would do when you're out camping. Yeah, which um, is what. Yeah, well, shepherds, because you, you know, you not have the pot and all that stuff, the water. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's why. Thank you, Eric. Um, and then also just finally, no leftovers. So you're going to wholly consume this. Um, anything that you're not eating, you're burning. Um, so nothing's wasted. All right. Uh, I gave you a bunch of passages there. I'm looking at the time, and so probably don't really have enough time to go through each and every single one of these. Um, but how does it relate 
to Jesus, John 1, 29 is John the Baptist pointing out Jesus saying, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, lamb pointing to this Passover lamb uh, whose blood covers a doorpost and it saves us from death. So this is the lamb that saves us from death, um, delivers us out of slavery. Um, so you have that direct uh, prophecy. First Peter 1, 17 to 21 says, the lamb, uh, we were not purchased with perishable things such as gold or silver, but by the holy precious blood of the lamb. Uh, referring to Jesus. And then John 19, 31 to 36, that's where you get the prophecy of none of his bones would be broken. Um, and then Hebrews uh, 7, that one. Yeah, we have the protection of Jesus' blood is Hebrews 7. And then Revelation 7, 9 to 17, um, that, that's the worshiping around the lamb who was slain, uh, that, that we dipped our robes in his blood and they came out pure um, and holy. So I would definitely recommend uh, taking the extra time to look at those references. So, so it's very clear that the Passover lamb ends up being a type of a foreshadowing of Jesus. Uh, so this is very purposeful. We can, of course, see it in hindsight, but already in their day, they can see that this one, a one-year-old, young, perfect lamb, that blood saves us from death and brings us out of slavery, which come Jesus, you can see how that's a reality, brings us out of the slavery to sin, saves us from the death that our sins merit. Um, also, an interesting thing to note in here uh, with the first Passover celebration, if you were not circumcised, could you partake in it? No. no. And, and if you were circumcised and you didn't partake in it, what happened to you then? So if you're an you're average, normal Israelite guy, and Passover came around, and you're like, meh, I don't feel like it this year. What was supposed to happen to you? Anyway, anybody catch that? It would be cut off. That's kind of how what a word we'd use. They'd be excommunicated. You would be kicked out. You would have no fellowship with God if you did not partake in the Passover. And foreigners, outsiders uh, who were not circumcised, so they were not adherents of their faith, you couldn't partake in this. And now you kind of see, this is where, you know, the Passover meal is then going to be taken and made into the Lord's Supper. And you can see that, that flowing through. Like, this is meant for believers. Um, this is not just meant for anybody and everybody. You couldn't just, you know, jump in and experience this. Um, you had to be an adherent of the faith. And then we do the same thing with the Lord's Supper, you know, that this is for believers. Uh, I am sorry, I have to catch up on the comments here. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, so Julia said, what if they did not have one that met that criteria? Are you talking about not having a blemish free year old lamb? Okay. Basically that's one of those questions where God wouldn't put them in that situation. Um, you'd be able to find somebody's lamb that would fit the criteria um, and it, and it is a uh, book of Malachi, which actually shows that they did have those kind of lambs and were purposely not, um, giving them to the Lord and the Lord calls them out on it. Um, so they would have had that plus just remember it's an agricultural society of shepherds. So the finding of the lamb would have been 
not really an issue ever. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about whether or not they'd have one. Uh, Faith, you asked, did they skin the lamb? I forget. Does anybody remember if it was mentioned in there specifically? I think they do. I think they do skin the lamb, but they don't like. In the Passover lamb, you don't take anything out. So you don't take out the intestines or anything like that. You just boil it or roast it. Sorry, not boil it. Um, and then did only males eat of the lambs? Oh, no, it was for everybody. It was for the families. That was noted in there. It wasn't just men but only men would be circumcised. So maybe that's where we're seeing the confusion. So the, the Passover meal was for the whole family. Everyone participated in it. And that's where you do, um, there are uh, seders that are still celebrated today, which is the modern Passover. Um, you can learn a lot from it. They have added quite a bit of tradition into it, but, um, the heart and core is still the same of it. So uh, you do have your, your there on page 25, your Passover Seder plate simple guide. Um, that's the stuff that you'd find in it today. But the only things mentioned are the lamb and then the two other things, unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. Uh, so what do the bitter herbs represent in the Passover meal? Bitterness of bondage. Yeah, it's remember, hey, you were slaves, and that was awful. Um, and then the, um, so there is a little bit of extra information given in chapter 13. Let's, okay, let's read chapter 13, uh, the first half of it up to verse 16. This will help kind of answer this, these questions. Um, all right, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. When Moses, Then Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, land he swore to your forefathers to give you, land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days eat bread without yeast, and on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days, nothing with yeast in it, is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your forefathers, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrificed the Lord, the first male offspring of every womb, and redeem each of my firstborn sons. It will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol in your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. Um, so he's bitter, the bitter herbs represent the bitter slavery, bitter bondage. Then the bread without yeast, what does that represent? You're leaving in a hurry, you didn't have time to raise, let the, the, let the dough rise. Yeah, did not have time to let the dough rise. Now I put in there 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 11. 
Um, and here's the thing. Yeast in the Bible comes up a few times. Most of the time, it is a negative thing. Basically, one little thing infects the whole thing. A little bit of yeast works through the whole batch of dough in reference to false teaching. And 1 Corinthians uh, 5 talks about um, don't let sin infect you and rise like yeast in dough. So get rid of the yeast of sin. There are a couple times, though, that yeast, yeast is used positively, like the kingdom of God is like yeast, a little bit of yeast, and this little thing, and it becomes this really big thing. So I'm not willing to just say, well, we should just interpret this to mean yeast is sin, therefore it's bad, that's why it's not in the bread. Um, what Eric said is much more um, in line with, the, well, you're eating it in haste, you don't have time for it to rise. Um, and so then just, it was a thing. You're going to eat unleavened bread, not just for the first Passover, but for all the Passovers in the future too. Uh, so it becomes a thing because you are being delivered, leave in a hurry. All right. Um, then just kind of wrapping up, uh, the Passover is so significant. This is page 26. The Passover is so significant that, this month would now become the start of the Jewish calendar year. What well, focus was God giving his people by having their calendar begin on the month that commemorated the Passover? I mean, this is, you're just starting your whole year on this deliverance. God delivered us from slavery. He delivered us from death. So this is what you're, you're focusing your new year on, that God brought us up out of Egypt and out of slavery. Uh, and then uh, the consecration of the firstborn, which we, uh, we had here, uh, offering every firstborn male animal from their flocks required financial sacrifice on the part of the Israelites, yet the Lord required it. God is interested in more than his people's material prosperity. He also wants them to develop their values, character, and spiritual life. As each succeeding generation of Israelites gave its firstborn males to God, they would in some way recreate the Exodus event. They would be reminded of the seriousness of sin whenever they ate the, me the meat of the animal. They would be reminded of the sacrificial meal eaten by their forefathers on the night of the Exodus. By sparing their own firstborn sons through the death of a sacrificial animal in obedience to the Lord's command, they would experience the life-saving grace of God in a deep and unforgettable way. Unlike the Canaanites who gave for firstborn sons and daughters to their gods by killing them, the Israelites were to let their children live. They were to pay a redemption price for each child redeemed. The males of the tribe of Levi were then to serve as a lifelong substitute for the redeemed sons. This command directly affected Jesus, who was consecrated for us. So yeah, very much this whole way of life developed out of this for them. And as they had to consecrate each of their firstborn males of their family, um, they would remember what God had done for them in the Exodus. So I don't have enough time, we really don't have enough time to go, but that's, it's a question worth thinking about. What things do we commemorate for future generations? Why do we commemorate them? Uh, let's pick that question up next time. Let's do that. Because that's, that's a question worth, worth our time, worth our consideration. So having gone over, any questions? <laughs> All right, so we're almost out of Egypt, almost out of Egypt. So we're, we're going to uh, cross the Red Sea uh, next week. Um, so Harry's going to be teaching you guys. I'm going to be out of town. Um, so but you will still have Bible study as normal. Google Meet, we're going to hope we can still get that done normally too. And Chuck will be back, which should help with that. Um, so, okay. So Bible study, we'll get, get you out of Egypt next week. All right. So let's, uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, as we got to see again the Passover, we see a picture of you, this perfect young uh, year old lamb, this one without blemish or defect. And truly, you are the one, the blemish free lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Through you, we are forgiven. We are made perfect. We are saved from our slavery to sin. 
we are freed from it and instead and also we are freed from from the death that our sins incurred so let us live now in the life that you have given us as the blood of you our lamb has washed away our sins and made us clean In your name we pray amen all right so thank you everybody